which takes us up to the Hundred Years' War. Um, now, the Hundred Years' War is called by that name because it lasted a little bit more than a hundred years. The war was between England and France. You would think that France could easily have won. France had more than four times the population of England, but France had problems. They generally were disunited, disloyal to their king, and the English were more, what you call, militarily innovative. That is, they were willing to change warfare, and the English were able to win some important victories. Now, the France, French were more steeped in tradition. They went to war the way their ancestors had for hundreds of years. The English went to war using new methods. The new methods were more effective. Now, here's what the Hundred Years' War changed about warfare. The number one that change was that knights no longer dominated the battlefield. Armored knights. Here's why. The invention of gunpowder rendered a knight's armor completely ineffective. In other words, if a cannonball hit a knight, he was, he, he was going to be killed, even more so perhaps with the armor on, he would have been without armor. A person had a better chance of surviving a bullet hit if he had no armor. Also, the, the armor got so heavy, I mean, what knights did was they put on heavier and heavier armor, and heavier armor Eventually, the armor got so heavy that if a knight slipped in the mud and fell in battle, it took five or six or more knights and squires to get him back up. And most of the time, once he fell, he would suffocate in his armor because he simply lacked the mobility to get himself back up. And eventually, knights decided, or uh, eventually, soldiers decided, hey, we don't need this kind of armor because it doesn't, it does us more harm than good. So armored knights, also the longbow became the weapon of choice. The longbow is about six foot long and it could shoot arrows several hundred yards. Before this, the weapon of choice had been the crossbow. Now the crossbow can shoot accurately and can shoot with a whole lot of force, but it cannot shoot as far as a longbow. The longbow, we could get an arrow up and high in the air and it would come down. Uh, in some of the battles, the French were using crossbows, the English using longbows. Well, the English could shoot at the uh, longbowmen before the longbowmen could get close enough to shoot back. And um, the result was a lot of uh, crossbowmen were killed before they ever had a chance to get a shot off. Um, there were two battles where they faced where the rain played a big role. When the rain came, the English longbowmen took their strings and put their strings or put their strings in dry, would be kept dry in their pouches wherever, so the bow strings were dry. The crossbowmen kept their strings out. As a result, the, the bows became utterly useless because the wet strings would tend to break or could not be pulled as hard. When the battle started, the English longbowmen just simply pulled out their dry strings and uh, they were able to shoot effectively with dried, with dried strings that could last a whole lot longer. Um, so, the um, bow, also these long bows could shoot arrows that could actually penetrate most of the armor of knights. Now some of the absolute best armor that only the wealthiest of knights could afford, only the wealthiest nobility, could repel an arrow from a long bow. But most of the knights could not afford that kind of armor, so the arrows would penetrate the long bow. And, uh, the, also, yeah, also, the crossbowmen could only shoot about one or two shots a minute. At best, a longbowman could get off about eight or ten shots a minute. Just one hail of arrows. So the arrows became so thick that actually they were dark in the sky. If you had been there at one of the battles, you might have seen a hail of arrows almost seemingly block out the light of the sun. And there was no way to dodge it because the arrows would come at you from hundreds of them at a time. And just one wave after another, just as fast as the bowman could get a shot off. 
and there was no place to hide. The bowmen were protected by, first of all, by pikemen. The pike men were men who uh, carried what we might call spears, but they called them pikes because the spear was a weapon that you could throw. A pike could not be thrown because it was too heavy. But the pike men would stand beside the longbowmen and protect them. I mean, I'm talking about the English now, not the French. Also, the uh, longbowmen would, would um, use axes and hammers to pound stakes into the ground. The stakes had a point on the end of it that would, uh, was designed to stop a knight in armor. In other words, a horseman in armor would run into the stakes and uh, it would hurt his horse. And um, in fact, what happened in a couple of battles, the uh, horses became wounded and then they became panicky and uh, they would throw their knights off their backs and the knight often got killed. But once he was thrown off, he either, if he didn't die from the fall, he died of suffocation because he could not get up in his armor once he had fallen off. Uh, so. And a lot of these military innovations worked greatly in favor of the English and greatly against the French. All right, now, that, that was the overview of the, how that the Hundred Years' War was to change warfare. Now, the, some of the causes. When I was in high school, we had a book that listed several causes of the war, but the only cause I want to mention here and now is that the English king claimed the throne, claimed that he had a right to be king of France, and he had one. Essentially, folk, you had Philip. Now, I've mentioned Philip the Fair already two or three times, and I mentioned how that Philip destroyed the Knights Templar. And supposedly the Grand Vizier of the Templars cursed the line of Philip and said, your descendants will not inherit the throne. And of course he also told the king to meet me around the throne of God. You and I want me to say to the king, you and the Pope meet me around the throne of God. Within a year, both the king and the Pope were dead. And one student in the next class had him, who was the Pope? Well, I looked it up over the weekend. The Pope's name was Clement V, for whatever that's worth. Don't write it down. But I do want you to remember Philip the Fair. Well, anyway, Philip had three sons, and these three sons ruled for a period of a total of 18 years, and all three of them died without producing a male heir. One of them, I believe, had a couple of daughters, but they all three died. So within 18 years, the throne of France, the Capetian dynasty, became vacant. Well, the King of England stepped in, Edward III, by name. Edward III said, all right, because my father married the king of France's daughter, I'm descended from the, I'm the nearest relative to the house of uh, Capet, to the Capetian line, therefore I should be king. And folk by genetic, by blood right, the king of England was right. He really did have a right to the French throne because his mother was descended from French royalty. Well, the French took the next nearest male relative and said, no, a man can't inherit the throne through a woman. Instead, we're going to pick a king who's really truly French. So they picked another king. And then as a result of this, the king of England, Edward III, went to war. And this war was to last 100 years, during which time the English kings claimed we should be king of France. The French people did not want the English king to be king. So uh, the fighting then was to go on. Now, there were at least two periods of 20 years when there was no fighting. So they were, the fighting wasn't constant, but it was, um, it would flare up, then die down, then flare up, and then die down. With, for the most part, the English winning, but the English were simply not, they didn't have enough population to really conquer France. They could defeat French armies in battle, which they did several times, but they really could not not enough uh, effect to, uh, to conquer France. All right. Anyway, um, your book mentions how the war began with a, a contempt for foot soldiers and for crossbowers because the knights, they were the noble high-born and the crossbowers and the uh, Foot soldiers, they were the lowborn. 
But it turned out that these low-born foot soldiers wound up killing nobility and knights in armor and high up nobility at an alarming rate and uh, made the people of England respect these commoners a whole lot more. The first major battle of the war was the Battle of Creasy. The French greatly outnumbered the English. However, I've already mentioned that in this battle, as in the Battle of Agincourt later, these two battles are so alike that I have gotten mixed up. But at the Battle of Creasy, the English both longbowmen had enough sense about them or enough common knowledge to keep their bowstrings dry, you know, just simply unstring their bows and make the bowstring go dry during a rainstorm. The French crossbowmen left their crossbows strung. As a result, these wet strings were ineffective in uh, producing enough spring to uh, shoot an arrow. The English went into battle with dry strings. The rain had left the field wet. Well, the English king, King Edward III, said to his knights, I want all of you knights to dismount, and you're going to battle on foot, because he decided that by being on foot was a safer way to fight. The French knights fought from horseback. The horses much too often slipped in the mud and broke their legs, and you know anything about horses when their legs are broken. That's the end of a life for the horse. Even today, we've saved very few horses' lives who have broken legs, very few. Um, but the, uh, a lot of the French knights <coughs> fell off their horses, suffocating in their armor. The French knights charged and were met by a hail of arrows. Something else, too. The English kept in formation. The longbowmen shot from a formation, and beside them were the stakes driven in the ground. Beside the longbowmen were pikemen who were to protect the longbowmen. The longbowmen had uh, many, many arrows in their quiver and uh, supply people who could supply them more, and they just sent a hail of arrows into the English knights who were charging horseback. Many a horse was wounded, and the wounded horses panicked and began to bolt and turn and run to the battlefield. The French also did not go to battle in any kind of organized formation. And again, the English organized. If any of you know anything about warfare, oftentimes the organized person will win. The organized side will win against the disorganized side. The result was the Battle of Creasy was a disaster for the French, a victory for the English. But again, as your book says, the English did not realize they simply could not conquer all of France. They didn't have the manpower to do so, but they didn't know that, so they kept trying. Well, um, the Battle of Creasy, again, was not decisive. A new English king took the throne, who was really eager to achieve victory, and he fought a battle of Agincourt. The Battle of Agincourt was very similar. A rainstorm had come up, the French had left their crossbows, let their crossbows get wet. The English longbowmen kept their longbows, their longbow strings dry. I mean, very, very similar. Again, the French knights charged on horseback. The English stayed on the ground. The English generally, I mean, they had armored knights, but uh, in both battles, the Battle of Creasy and the Battle of Agincourt, the losses were really overwhelmingly great for the uh, overwhelming great for the French and very very small for the English. Now again, it's, our modern day critics have a hard time believing the figures. Say the figures for the English are too low, the figures for the loss of the French are too high. But other people defend the chroniclers and say, hey, they uh, they are fairly accurate. But it's difficult for us to tell today just how many were lost on each side, but it is apparent that the French lost a whole lot more than the English in both battles. Again, both battles are, had their several things in common. They proved that armored knights were outmoded. The days of the nobles dominating the battlefield were over, among other things. And uh, it was to forever change warfare uh, kings eventually learned, hey, I don't need armored knights anymore, so they would dismiss a lot of the armored knights and instead hire troops. Uh, again, all this, all these changes came about as a result of the uh, Hundred Years' War.